Today's clips included use of discussion of the rule of law in connection with Brexit, Hong Kong's proposed new extradition law, dismissal of a Harvard academic dean, and the Alabama abortion law, among others. Now, I'm coming from an organization that has as its vision a world of rule of law communities that deliver justice, opportunity, and peace. You would think that this would be a moment of triumph, all of this rule of law talk. And indeed, it is welcome to a degree. But while some of this attention is, uh, is helpful to our cause, I am afraid that the, the cacophony of rule of law talk both reflects and contributes to a weakening of the norm. And that challenge, its implications for today's world, and what we can and should be doing about it are the subject of my talk today. Let me begin with a word about definition. What is it that we are talking about here? The rule of law is, of course, a concept that dates to ancient times and in one form or another can be found in the legal and philosophical traditions of most cultures. It encompasses the idea of accountability of people and institutions to law. It was articulated among our founders, most famously by John Adams, as a government of laws, not men. And those founders institutionalized the idea in a constitutional framework that, of course, provides checks and balances on government authority. In more recent times, it has broadened to include a number of substantive and procedural elements, many of them codified in modern international human rights law. Sometimes referred to as thick rule of law, this idea was reflected in the definition adopted in Kofi Annan's 2004 report on the subject later embraced by the UN General Assembly in a 2012 resolution. That definition here is that the rule of law is a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. It requires, as well, measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. A primary focus of the World Justice Project's work is to elaborate and to promote a universally accepted an understandable definition of this concept, the rule of law. Based on international standards, including the standards that lie below this UN definition, and through consultation and peer review from ex experts around the world and even a few in this room, we have distilled the idea to the following. The rule of law is a durable system of laws institutions, and community commitment that delivers four universal principles. And they are arrayed there. Shorthand, it's just laws, open government, accessible and impartial dispute resolution, and, oh, I forgot accountability. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and elaborating, it's accountability, again, of, of government, as well as private actors under the law. The just laws must be clear, publicized, and stable, applied evenly, and protect fundamental rights. Open government is shorthand for processes by which the laws are enacted, administered, and enforced that are accessible, fair, and efficient. And then, of course, accessible and impartial dispute resolution uh, is shorthand for justice delivered in a timely manner by competent, <coughs> ethical, and independent representatives and neutrals who are accessible, have adequate resources, and are reflective of the makeup of the communities they serve. <clears throat> Let me just pause here for a moment and underscore the preamble of this definition. Often, even we at WJP 
skip straight to the four universal principles. But for reasons that I will elaborate later, and I hope will become um, apparent in this talk, it's equally or more important to understand the rule of law, not as any one rule or outcome, but as this durable system, a system of laws, institutions, and community commitment. Based on this definition, the WJP has developed a methodology for measuring adherence to the rule of law, the rule of law index. Some of you may have picked up the thick book outside, and I'm going to insist that the rest of you do so that I don't have to carry this home. Um, the rule of law index evaluates uh, the rule of law across eight factors distilled from those four principles. And these are the, the eight factors. Constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. Again, a, a thick definition of the rule of law. Within each of those factors, we've identified sub-factors, 44 in total, that make up this measurement of the rule of law um, in, in our index. And they are elaborated on page 10, I think, in the big book, and page 20 of the purple pamphlet, if you pick that up. But so much for keeping it simple, eight factors and 44 sub-factors. And I'll return to that in our index findings in a moment. First, I'd like, um, now that we are clear about what we're talking about, to see how others are using this language, this rule of law language, in the world today. These are the sub-factors. As I said at the outset, we see widespread invocation of the rule of law, some of it consistent with the definitions I have outlined, but other cases quite far afield from that definition. Too often, we see the loose invocation of rule of law to legitimize policy preferences or law enforcement without regard for whether the laws or the system of enforcement is just. For example, <laughs> Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte's bloody war on drugs, China's crackdown on human rights lawyers, and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's anti-corruption campaign have each been cast by their architects and defenders as rule of law actions necessary for or an enhancing of the rule of law. Of course, critics of these very same events claim equally vehemently that they violate the rule of law. The headlines arrayed here illustrate the facile use of this terminology. So in the first case, of course, a Philippine editor claiming that Duterte's campaign is violating rule of law. Simultaneously, Duterte's spokesperson calls it uh, a rule of law action, basically cutting through the red tape that is otherwise um, troubling governance. Uh, and then the last three headlines here are examples from China. Xi Jinping is talking about his actions as upholding the Constitution and rule of law. And opponents uh, claim that they are violations of human rights and undermining the rule of law. <coughs> so this is a real challenge for us if the very same things can be characterized as either advancing or undermining rule of law. Bringing it closer to home, we see the distinctions in approach to rule of law um, played out here in the context of debate around uh, climate change regulation on the top, and the bottom here, immigration policy. Is it a victory for rule of law to turn over to states the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions of coal-fired power plants? That's what the Trump administration argued in the first quote here claiming that the Obama administration before it had unlawfully expanded federal authority in this area. So Environmental Protection Agency Acting Administrator Andrew Wheeler, at that time he was acting, uh, announced the new regulation 
with a, a press statement that the, the rule would restore the rule of law and empower states to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We see similar uh, confusing statements about the rule of law in the immigration context. And just to be very clear, this is not, not political one, uh, one party or the other that abuses. This is a equal opportunity uh, confusion. <laughs> And uh, so we see on immigration relating to the Trump administration's new approach to processing asylum claims, a uh, White House fact sheet that says the Trump administration is rightfully and fully restoring the rule of law on our southern border. And simultaneously, uh, a columnist for New York Magazine on the other uh, side of the spectrum commenting about a <coughs> judicial ruling that was um, and joining that new approach to asylum, uh, that judicial uh, ruling as reminding the president of the rule of law at the border. So this is, uh, this is really complicated and confusing. Certainly unlawful crossings at the border are contrary to the rule of law. But on the other hand, what are the rule of law constraints on countermeasures against illegal immigration? The difficulty of these questions highlights the danger of invoking the rule of law bumper sticker and talking about such policies. I would argue that we should not speak of these specific, quite technical policy choices in rule of law terms. Doing so opportunistically, even cynically, is misleading. The media reports it credulously on both sides of the issue. The public is confused. And from my perspective, most concerning, the content of this important norm erodes in the process. It is critically important that we clarify the meaning of the rule of law in the face of this kind of confusing co-opting of the terminology. To be clear, just because a policy is pursued through law does not mean that it upholds the rule of law if those laws are not applied equally. A nation governed by rule of law should check corruption, but not do so selectively or arbitrarily or without regard to due process. The rule of law promises order and security, but not at the expense of fundamental rights. The rule of law doesn't take sides in policy debates or in elections. So long as the outcomes are governed by duly enacted laws that are clear and accessible, are applied equally to all, protect fundamental rights, and are reviewed by an independent judiciary or dispute resolution body, misuse of the rule of law label blurs these important distinctions. This obscuring of important dimensions of the rule of law is not just a matter of concern for those of us with a wonky interest in this concept of the rule of law. Some sort of, you know, my kids sometimes accuse me of a <laughs> philosophical obsession with this idea. Um, but no, it has real world implications for governance, <coughs> respect of human rights, global stability, and peace. Now how is that? It's just words after all. But an environment in which the rule of law means whatever anyone says it means, in which any policy simply pursued through law is said to uphold the rule of law, such an environment is vulnerable to the weaponization of law. By this I mean the use of law for anything but rule of law purposes. To consolidate power, undermine checks and balances in government, civil society and the media. This is unfortunately the pattern that we are seeing around the world in many countries taking an authoritarian turn these days. It's sometimes referred to as the authoritarian's playbook. So similar are the steps that we can see being taken to erode the rule of law and human rights in countries as far afield and as diverse as Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Venezuela, the Philippines, and on and on. 
Certain recurring elements occur. Often first comes constitutional refor reform that distorts the electoral process or undermines the independence of the judiciary. After that wave of attack on rule of law institutions, we often see changes to electoral laws and to media and civil society regulation. This serves the purpose of supporting a perpetual majority for the ruling party and eliminating critical voices in society. These steps are often followed by the use or misuse of law enforcement tools, particularly those relating to combating corruption or terrorism, to selectively target political rivals. Often these moves are incremental and facially unobjectionable, even touted and justified as advancing the rule of law. But over time and seen together, there is a pattern that clearly undermines key elements of the rule of law. As I heard a Polish human rights defender explain recently, each of these developments alone seem unobjectionable. You don't even notice, and then one day, you wake up and you're living in an entirely different country. For those of us who care about the rule of law, what is particularly challenging about these developments is how our agenda, our rhetoric, has been seized and turned against the rule of law. It is akin to what we saw in the 1990s. The end of the Cold War, it didn't take very long for those with an authoritarian bent to seize upon the fact that they need, needed to go through the motions of carrying out elections, um, and, and that there were ways in which they could do that and not really provide a meaningful democratic choice. They could keep their publics and international critics nominally at bay and claim democracy, albeit an illiberal democracy, by going through these motions of elections. So too now, with the rule of law vogue, we see authoritarians invoking rule of law for actions that are anything but governed by the rule of law. In some ways, it's more challenging and more pernicious than that earlier wave of illiberal <laughs> democracy. Because it's pretty clear when uh, an authoritarian is rigging an election and when they get 90% of the vote and they happen to stay in office for 20 or 30 years, it doesn't really pass the laugh test. But when rule of law and legal institutions and norms are misused, it's harder to, uh, to call a spade a spade in those kinds of contexts. What we see emerging uh, with this co-opting of the rule of law rhetoric and rule of law uh, institutions is not rule of law, in fact, but rule by law. This rule by law involves law and is often effective in delivering order and security, one of our eight factors of the rule of law. But other than that, it bears little resemblance to rule of law. It does not effectively constrain government authority or protect fundamental freedoms. Dispute resolution is rarely impartial, and criminal justice is often abused to target political opponents. Sometimes we see short-term gains in combating corruption by rule of law state, rule by law states, yet here too the gains are often short-lived and selective, and soon they are swamped by the, by the corruption that grows almost inevitably with consolidated and unchecked power. Harkening back to John Adams, rule by law is not a government of laws, not men, but rather a government of laws for men, or women, I should say. Don't mean to be gendered here. Adams was, maybe, but. Um, <laughs> but that's what we're seeing in this rule by law. These patterns of distortion of rule of law are showing up clearly in the World Justice Project's index data as well. That's contained in, in the report, and, and Beth, we might pass around these. People are interested in, in seeing the detail of that data. 
As I mentioned, a central focus of WJP's work is to bring clarity and rigor to all of this rule of law talk. The index methodology is based on survey data collected from two sources. We do a survey of experts, legal practitioners, and academics in the countries that we're studying, and also households, uh, a representative sample of a thousand households in each country. The 2019 index, which you have either in summary form or complete, uh, covers 126 countries, and we are each year adding additional countries and hope to get to 175, maybe even 194 um, in a few years. <coughs> the surveys ask very specific questions corresponding to the eight factors and 44 sub-factors that I mentioned earlier. They're questions about uh, real life experience of the rule of law. Questions like, have you been the victim of a crime? Have you had contact with the police? Have you sought information from a government agency? Have you been solicited for a bribe? Are you treated with less courtesy than other people? And depending on the answers to those questions, then there are additional follow-on questions that really probe that experience. More than 500 questions and answers are coded to make up the sub-factor and factor scores and to provide a very rich tapestry of the rule of law as it's experienced in each country. In the big book, you, and you can find, and also online, uh, the details of the rule of law scores on all of these questions. You can see the rankings of the countries 1 to 126, um, globally, regionally, by income group, and compare and contrast across sub-factor as well as um, the rule of law as a whole. This is broken down by region and factor scores. And these nifty little Rorschach tests <laughs> are, uh, are spider graphs that reflect the scores on the sub-factors. And the bigger, rounder, the spider graph, the better the rule of law, the more uh, compact the image, the more challenged rule of law is. If you have the big book, you can look at the page. It's an alphabetical that has Norway on one page and Pakistan on the other and get a striking comparison of robust rule of law and challenged rule of law in that illustration. <coughs> One thing this exercise has taught us is that it is difficult to draw sweeping or definitive conclusions about the rule of law and what is driving it in one direction or the other, certainly at a global level. Changes are generally incremental, context specific, and often very difficult to analyze from a causation perspective. But with, even with that caution, when we look over multiple years, we see some striking findings emerging from this most recent 2019 index. First of all, rule of law is clearly declining globally, with more countries, significantly more countries, declining in overall rule of law performance for a second year in a row. 31 countries saw a decline in their rule of law score of 1% or more, with just 23 countries seeing an improvement of the same amount. Moreover, we are seeing more deterioration in high-performing countries than we are seeing improvement in low-performing countries. So it's maybe hard to see, but if you have the purple book, this um, chart is in there as well. <coughs> What we see here is the orange side are countries that are declining in rule of law, certainly more on that side than on the green side where they are improving. And you see most of those declining are those who are the high performers in the upper left above the median. By contrast, where you want to see improvement are in the, the low performing, low rule of law states in the lower right quadrant. Those are below the median, but uh, only 7 or 13% of those improving. 
Beyond an overall deterioration uh, in this rule of law picture, our data reinforces our sense that authoritarianism is on the rise. The factor, factor one in our index, on constraints on government powers declined in more countries than any other factor worldwide over the last year. 61 countries declined in this factor one, constraints on government power. 23 stayed the same, 29 improved. Widening our lens a bit and looking at the numbers over four years, a full 60% of countries have seen a decline in constraints on government power. So that's up the very top one, number one up there. The second largest decline over the last year was seen in the area of criminal justice, followed by open government and fundamental rights. Over a four year period, it is the factor measuring fundamental rights, so that's this one down, the fourth one down, that has declined most markedly. Over four years, fully 70% of countries have seen a deterioration in fundamental rights. This next slide shows a, a close-up of the situation in Europe over the past four years. Green arrows reflect improving rule of law, orange arrows declining with the size of the arrow corresponding to the size of the change. And you can see what jumps out are big, two big orange arrows for Hungary and Poland, sharply declining in rule of law, and particularly in the measures of constraints on government powers, fundamental rights, and criminal justice. The only positive moves, and then Hungary and Poland are detailed here, orange arrows all going down, some as much as 25% on constraints on government power in Poland, um, the only uh, arrows, only factors that are improving in these countries are absence of corruption and order and security, plus regulatory enforcement in the case of Poland. This slide looks at these same trends globally over the past four years, with countries arrayed according to their overall rule of law index score, so up top here, you have Denmark going all the way down. And this is, saw, this is also in the purple book if you want to look at it more closely. Um, what, what we have is the orange arrows, or reddish orange arrows, um, reflect declines in constraints on government powers. And the green ones, um, improvement in constraints on government powers. And what's very clearly, globally, overwhelmingly, is this a decline over recent years on constraints on government power. And it's this, that this snapshot, I think, more than anything, that is sounding our alarm bells on authoritarianism. What's the white indicate? The indication for what? You have orange and green. There may be a couple of... New Zealand and Australia. That maybe didn't, didn't move at all, I think. or no, cha no change at all. Since this is your annual human rights lecture, let me um, dwell for a moment about the specific ways in which, oops, steal my own th thunder there. The specific ways in which the deterioration in rule of law relates to human rights. In our thick definition of rule of law, core human rights are a critical element uh, of, of the definition, particularly those rights that provide a check on government authority and guarantee non-discrimination, fairness, and impartiality in decision making. Factor four on fundamental rights for our definition includes non-discrimination, the right to life and security, due process and the rights of the accused, freedom of opinion and association, freedom of uh, religion, freedom from arbitrary interference with privacy, and freedom of assembly and association as well as labor rights. So there's a, a robust human rights component to our conception of rule of law itself. In addition to these rights that have been baked into the definition and our measurements of rule of law, other elements of the rule of law, of course, 
for example, the independent judiciary, are foundational guarantees of respect for human rights. Given this intertwined relationship between rule of law and human rights, we find ourselves currently in a worrisome doom loop of deterioration in both rule of law and respect for human rights. As you can see in the data, we see declining respect for human rights as a driver of our overall measures of rule of law. At the same time, erosion of certain aspects of rule of law, especially constraints on government power, are paving the way for some of what, some, what some have described as a contemporary human rights crisis. With a growing stranglehold on independent media, systematic attacks on civil society and human rights defenders, and scapegoating of minorities and marginalized groups, characterizing much of what we're seeing in the human rights and the rule of law landscape. In this way, I would describe the deterioration in human rights as both cause and effect of the rule of law challenge we face. Particularly troubling is when we see government action that violates human rights justified as upholding the rule of law. That's a weaponization of, of the rule of law that violates these rights. But that's the upside down world in which we are living. So how do we get here? How do we get to a world where the rule of law stands for its opposite, where law can be manipulated to restrict rights? This is a critical question and one to which I can only begin to offer some suggestions. This is an area of ongoing study by us at WJP and I hope one of the reasons I'm here is that I hope to stimulate some of you to help us find the answers. Let me just share a few observations from our work that suggests the direction that we're headed in, in studying the data about this. First of all, we uh, have a fundamental challenge in lack of understanding of this concept of the rule of law. What is it, how it works, and why citizens should, should support or defend it. This is an illustrative infographic of WJP data. One of the questions we ask in our survey is, you know, what, what are the three words that come to mind when uh, I say the rule of law? And this is data from the United States. The number one answer by far is I don't know. <laughs> and then you see a word cloud of everything else. And there's lots of interesting stuff in there. Everything from enforcement and community and just to none, <laughs> compliance, police, rule, great or my favorite, cool. <laughs> uh, we, we, we asked this question in all 126 countries. The answers are um, more or less the same. Almost In almost every country, the number one answer is, I don't know. And um, there is rarely much more uh, consistency uh, in terms of the other words that are associated. So there's a confused and um, somewhat disillusioned picture that emerges here. We begin to see why citizens the world over can be persuaded that rule by law is rule of law. Second, institutions are failing their citizens. WJP recently completed a global study on uh, access to justice covering 100 countries and asking people how they solve their everyday legal problems. The findings are striking. 1.5 billion people globally lack access to justice for their everyday civil justice needs. Things like landlord-tenant issues, labor issues, consumer debt, family law issues. The kinds of problems that our data suggest 50% of us have had in the last two years. This justice gap plagues developed as well as developing countries, but it affects poor and disadvantaged populations in all of those countries disproportionately. Moreover, the, the 
suffering that those populations experience because of their lack of access to justice is compounded. The greater impact on health, on housing, on employment opportunities. In the United States, studies suggest that fully 85% of poor people do not access the justice system to solve their legal problems. It is no wonder, then, that citizens do not trust in, let alone defend, their justice systems and that they are vulnerable to promises of an assertive authoritarian state. We see some evidence of this trust factor, or maybe I should call it a distrust factor, in our index data on corruption. Corruption remains a significant rule of law challenge globally, especially in developing countries. As you can see in this slide, so the green or kind of aqua is least corrupt, pink uh, more or most corrupt. And you can see remains a, a challenge for us globally. But looking more closely at the trend data over the past four years on corruption, an interesting picture <laughs> emerges. Citizens are reporting a declining perception of corruption in the very countries where authoritarianism is on the rise. Recall the data on Hungary and Poland, where corruption was one of the only two factors where there was an improvement, notwithstanding the overall deterioration in rule of law. There is more work to be done on this, but our hypothesis is that corruption and other sources of dissatisfaction with government are drivers of populist backlash and tolerance for authoritarian alternatives. We see the evidence of this in pretty marked improvements, at least in the early years following a transition toward authoritarianism, and as citizens embrace the promises of their new regimes, however hostile they may actually be to the rule of law. We see these positive perceptions about corruption fade over time. So in Hungary now, it's only, over the last two years, only about a 2% improvement in corruption, whereas at the, in, right after the transition, it was more marked. But, but even that window of time creates an opportunity for opponents of rule of law and human rights to make significant inroads in some cases, upsetting constitutional frameworks and reversing years of governance gains in ways that are very difficult to recover from. With these observations about the state of the rule of law today and how we got here, let me conclude with some thoughts about an effective response. First, it won't surprise you that I will return to the definition and the importance of clarity about this concept of the rule of law, its dimensions, and its complexity. We need to avoid overly simplified or soundbite versions of, of the rule of law. If I may, even in a law school, I have to um, argue that we should resist the lawyer's penchant for definitive findings and judgments and verdicts that something is or is not consistent with the rule of law. I hate to admit it. Don't tell my uh, social scientist colleagues back at the office. But I have come to appreciate the nuance that they bring and their uh, methodological tools bring to this conversation. Talk of, of relationships a correlation of systems is, is much more helpful um, than the way that lawyers often talk about rule of law. I think those ideas and that language needs to be reinforced in the way that we talk about rule of law. Underscoring the notion of it as a system that delivers on multiple dimensions over time the distorting and confusing effects of talking categorically about particular policies or developments as restoring or breaching the rule of law should be avoided. This is not to say that the idea cannot be popularized. Indeed, this would be my second point. 
we need not only clarity about the concept, but also widespread education about it. A British colleague shared this picture with me recently, snapped of a uh, sign that's on the wall of his daughter's elementary school. If you can't read it, it says, at the Cavendish School, we know that laws are important to ensure everyone's rights are respected. That apparently imposes some order in the playground. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simplified version. It's not eight factors and 44 sub-factors, but it's, there's still embedded in it some useful complexity. It embraces at least two critical dimensions, often competing dimensions, of the rule of law, this idea of law and rights. If school children can get this, then the broader public and media can too. Critically important is education at all levels, outreach to key constituencies, speaking out when the terminology is misused or abused or cynically deployed to advance an agenda. Beyond this important definitional work, there are critical steps to be taken in calling a spade a spade as we see rule of law deterioration around the world. Not in the soundbite type rhetoric that I've highlighted with some of the, the um, headlines here tonight, but reflecting the complexity of the concept and the dynamics affecting it. This is, of course, the heart of the work that we are doing with the Rule of Law Index, and we welcome your help in disseminating these findings broadly. We will uh, also applaud the efforts of any of you to help us bring uh, the insights of the academy uh, and, and methodological rigor and understanding of this complicated concept and contributing that to the conversation. It's also important, particularly in countries experiencing deterioration, to stand with and protect those working, sometimes at great risk, to uphold the rule of law. 